All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome in. We are excited to have you here. We are here for the National Marine Mammal Foundation Scientific Snapshot. Just about four o'clock, so I'm going to keep admitting people as they come on in. All right, we still got some people rolling in, so I'm going to keep on admitting. All right, it's starting to slow down a bit, so I am going to get started. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our Scientific Snapshot virtual seminar series. I am Celeste Perry. Uh, this is just one of the programs offered by our community engagement team here at the National Marine Mammal Foundation. And this focuses specifically on sharing our science with adult audiences. So we're so happy you could join us. Um, but we also have some great programs for children and even an online course. So if you got kiddos, make sure to check that out on our website. Here with us today are Dr. Kelly Winship and Amber Ramos from the National Marine Mammal Foundation Conservation Biology Program. The goal of the Conservation Biology Program is to perform fundamental research on the biology of marine mammals, including their behavior, physiology, and ecology, with the goal of mitigating human impact and improving the conservation of marine mammal species. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, please send them to Celeste Perry. You'll see my name right there. Next to it, it says questions. Uh, the general chat has been disabled, but you can send those messages straight to me and I'll keep track of questions. We'll try to get to as many as we can throughout the meeting. Um, so with that, I am going to turn it over to our presenters, Kelly and Amber. They can introduce themselves and, and tell you a little bit more about Eve um the special guest of the evening so amber and kelly take it away hi everyone my name is kelly winship and i'm a scientist at the national marine mammal foundation my name is amber ramos and i'm a senior trainer at the national marine mammal foundation for the past three years we have been tasked with developing a novel form of environmental enrichment for the u.s navy's population of california sea lions and bottlenose dolphins so today we're going to be introducing you to eat the enclosure video enrichment system designed for use by the U.S. Navy's marine mammals. As animal care professionals, maintaining the highest standards of welfare is an important caretaker responsibility. One facet of animal welfare is providing mental and physical stimulation, which can be accomplished through appropriate environmental enrichment. Enrichment can be applied through the introduction of objects and scents, providing learning opportunities through training sessions, as well as modifying the habitat. If you have ever visited an accredited zoo or aquarium, you have probably seen some form of enrichment in animal enclosures, such as boxes, balls, or other objects that we would consider to be toys. Or maybe you've been able to observe keepers or trainers interacting with the animals during voluntary training sessions. Not only are these sessions important for animal health care by giving the caretakers the opportunity to check animal health, but they are also enriching. Research has shown that these types of sessions have positive impacts on animal welfare, and they are becoming increasingly common in zoos and aquariums with a variety of different species. Practicing enrichment variability is crucial in maintaining the enriching quality of these sessions. If the animals get used to an object, it will lose its enriching effect. There has also been a recent surge in the implementation of more cognitively challenging enrichment. The use of computers in such enrichment provides an easy and variable way to display different puzzles or conceptual games to appropriately challenge the animals and keep them engaged. It also allows researchers the opportunity to better understand how animals think and process information and how we can, bet and can provide important insight on how not only to better care for different species, but also how we can better protect them in changing wild habitats. California sea lions are one of the most common marine mammals in professional care, and wild sea lions frequently strand on the U.S. West Coast in need of rescue and medical care. Sea lion enrichment programs frequently involve human interactions, objects, 
and changing how food is presented, such as hiding it in the habitat or freezing it in a block of the ice for animals to play with. While they are known for their trainability and their impressive performance in cognitive studies, there is little reported research on the use of cognitively challenging enrichment for these animals. Dolphin enrichment programs also tend to involve objects, modifying how food is presented, as well as human interactions. They have been much more frequently exposed to cognitively challenging enrichment, such as underwater mazes, cooperative puzzle feeders, planning tests, and interactive underwater keyboards. Technology in the form of video clips has been used for killer whales, bottlenose, and rough-toothed dolphins, with data suggesting differences in engagement between the sexes as well as species. Here, a subadult male bottlenose is interacting with the television as SpongeBob plays. However, video clips do not respond or change based on the animal's behavior or are able to be controlled by the animal in a setup like this. Over a decade ago, an echolocation-driven cursor was invented for use by dolphins. However, not too much progress has been made in creating an animal-controlled form of technological enrichment in either dolphins or sea lions. The U.S. Navy cares for bottlenose dolphins and California sea lions in San Diego Bay. These animals participate in noble tasks involving national security as well as bioacoustic and physiological research that allows us to better understand how to protect and conserve marine mammals in the wild. For example, we study things such as dolphin echolocation and marine mammal hearing, which can inform important government and conservation policies meant to protect ocean animals. Current enrichment involves the use of objects and training sessions, both within the home habitat as well as during open ocean free release sessions. There was an interest in creating a form of complex enrichment for the animals to utilize when they return to their home habitat. We wanted to provide a cognitive challenge similar to what has been given to non-human primates and other zoological animals. We faced several challenges in adapting this design as aquatic habitats are typically not conducive to functioning electronic equipment and the lack of opposable thumbs makes operating a joystick pretty difficult. Participation in this research is voluntary for the animals, and we pride ourselves in ensuring these sessions are reinforcing for the animals to encourage their participation. To create the EVE setup, a 27-inch monitor was mounted on a plastic utility cart and protected by plexiglass. An electrical box was modified to house four arcade-style buttons, which would be used to move the cursor. The games were programmed in the Unity development platform using c -sharp and run through a laptop connected by HDMI cable to the monitor. The games are also able to work with an automated feeder to deliver fish and ice to reward the animals for success. To begin, we decided to introduce Eve to three Navy sea lions. The start and end of session screens, shown here, record information about the session. The games export button pressing data, as well as the time it took to reach the game's goal throughout gameplay to Excel sheets for records and analysis. The goal of the initial game is to move the blue circle cursor, a color chosen based on prior vision research in sea lions and dolphins, to touch the black square target. Contact with the target results in a tone and the opportunity for reinforcement. The sea lion moves the cursor by pressing directional buttons on the four button controller. In early sessions, the sea lions were trained to press a button that was not connected to the controller and could later be used to prompt the animals to push different buttons in order to move a cursor. The first controller we used was large and had a plastic covering. This design seemed to cause some confusion, such as touching the center of the controller rather than the actual buttons. So a smaller controller was built and the plastic covering was discarded. One of the biggest challenges was to teach the sea lions to focus on the screen rather than their trainer. To do this, the trainer would reinforce eye movement when the sea lion's gaze corresponded with any movement on the screen. The trainer was able to be phased out once the sea lion was reliably switching buttons and monitoring the screen. Other tools, such as asking the animals to wait, back up, or shift their body weight aided in the training of button pressing precision. The cursor training game consists of six different training phases in which different aspects of gameplay are introduced. The first phase only requires the animal to briefly touch any one of the buttons in order to make contact with a target. 
In phase two, gray walls continue to restrict movement in incorrect directions. However, more sustained contact in one direction is required. Phase three allows for movement in all directions. However, sustained movement in the correct direction will always result in a success given the longer target. In phase four, the long target breaks into smaller targets and the sea lion must hit all targets to move to the next level. Each contact results in a tone and a reward. However, some animals would contact multiple targets before stopping for the reward. In phase five, there are two opposing targets requiring all four buttons to be pressed. In this example, the automated feeder is providing the reinforcement for target contact. The last phase, phase six, is the final test in cursor acquisition. For most targets, the sea lion must press at minimum two different buttons to make contact with the target. These levels are substantially harder as both the cursor and the target are smaller and many of the targets float away from walls, requiring the sea lion to stop and change buttons with precision and timing. The sea lions graduated from this game when they had three sessions of an average of seven or less button presses per level and less than six seconds to reach the target from the first button press. All sea lions achieved this in less than 73 sessions over the course of a year and a half. The fastest animal took 59 sessions over eight months. While it took them a long time to fully grasp this concept compared to how long it would take a human to understand it, the animals consistently showed excitement and interest to participate from the early stages. While this type of game would be very simple for humans to learn, these concepts were completely novel to the sea lions. They found each small step towards understanding the game reinforcing and chose to enthusiastically participate. The cursor training game is still used as a fun refresher game to maintain the button pressing skills and keep up the reinforcement history of the system following more challenging sessions. Once the sea lions graduated from the cursor training game, they are provided with a new game. For two of the sea lions, they were first shown the match to sample game. For this game, they touch the shape at the top of the screen and then match the corresponding shape that appears on either the right or the left. An incorrect choice results in a black screen for three seconds before the next level loads. For the third sea lion, he moved on to the maze game. While the core concept of contacting the target remained the same, the rules to do so have changed. We modeled this game off of previous work by Michael Barron and his colleagues in Georgia when they assessed the planning ability of monkeys, chimpanzees, and human children. For this game, the sea lion can only move to the left or the right as long as he is on a gray platform. He cannot move to the side while he was falling and he cannot move up or down using the buttons. You might notice that when he falls, he switches buttons to try and move closer to the target. To help with this concept, we started with a single platform close to the bottom of the screen and a very large target. Using a 90% or above criterion for two consecutive sessions, the platforms would slowly move up and become smaller. Additional platforms were added and the target was then reduced in size. As his gameplay improved, he was shown the original training layout from Baron and colleagues' 2015 work with the primates, which started with three platforms at the top of the screen. Using the same criteria, he then played levels with multiple rows of platforms, requiring him to make more decisions and switch buttons quickly in order to make contact with the target. Eventually, vertical walls were added that restricted his movement on the horizontal plane as well. At this stage, he began to progress more rapidly and was able to complete the last training phase within two sessions, achieving his advancement criterion immediately.
After this, he was then exposed to testing levels in order to assess his planning ability using the new rules he had just learned through playing the training version of the game. Other games this individual has since mastered include a game called Chase, in which the target, a small fish shape, moves along a predetermined path whenever he contacts a button. The shape moves in a predictable or unpredictable pattern with varying speeds. This animal has adapted an interesting strategy in which he will sometimes wait in a corner and watch the fish move across the screen before attempting to catch it. Additionally, because of the proficiency of the animals when playing the cursor training game following these more challenging sessions, we created more challenging levels in order to lengthen the sessions and provide additional challenge. For these levels, the sea lion must use a small cursor to contact multiple small targets, only receiving the tone and the opportunity for reinforcement when all targets have been contacted. Now for the dolphins, we are dealing with very different habitats and physiology. We decided to use a large projector screen and reverse project the games onto the screen. We played videos for desensitization, and besides noticing that they found SpongeBob much more interesting than nature documentaries, we were pleased to see that they were interested in the moving lights and sound and had no discernible hesitation towards approaching the setup. However, just like with the sea lions, we needed to ensure that they were paying attention to the screen and not the trainer. To accomplish this, they were taught to take hand signals from the screen, which was slightly challenging given the layout of the habitat and a lack of an underwater viewing window. To work around this, we rigged a curtain setup to train the dolphins to look at the screen and take hand signals from videos. Transforming into amateur magicians, we changed between a live action person giving hand signals and a video of that person giving the same signals. Using a large black curtain, we raised and lowered it to expose which version of the person they should attend to. The dolphins were also trained to station on a bite plate that magnetically attaches to a joystick, which functions as their controller. Because the bite plate is heavy, the joystick is currently depressed in the down position from the initial starting point, which has required adjustments to the training levels that have been used by the sea lions. The dolphins are asked to station on the bite plate and are reinforced from moving the blue circle to contact the black target. Here, a dolphin is playing phase three of their version of the cursor training game. We continue to make modifications to this setup and the levels to find the best controller, as well as what level layouts train this concept the most efficiently in this species. Eve has provided several benefits for the Navy's animals. Firstly, it functions as a variable and cognitively challenging activity that we hope to be able to implement during off-session times for animal benefit. Because we are able to use it with an automatic feeder, Eve could assist in prolonging the duration of these cognitively challenging sessions for animals that might benefit from longer access. Eve is also providing us with opportunities to further explore cognitive processes such as memory and planning, as well as aspects of welfare such as choice. Eve was created for the health and welfare of the Navy's animals, and we have seen positive behavioral responses to Eve's sessions, as well as engagement and excitement in the opportunity to play new games. Eve also serves as an experiential learning opportunity for students, allowing undergraduate and graduate students hands-on experience working with the animals, as well as learning valuable new skills, such as data management and programming within the Unity platform. The future of EVE is an exciting one. We look forward to expanding the game catalog to include other cognitive concepts, further assess its benefits as a welfare tool, as well as developing games that could aid in veterinary assessment of vision. The visual acuity test serves as a mean to assess sea lion vision as they age. For this test, the black and white box is always correct, while the gray box is always incorrect. 
By measuring performance on this test, we can determine a sea lion's visual acuity as the black and white lines become thinner and appear more as gray. One of our sea lions has recently been introduced to the selection game, which provides him sessions in which he can choose what game he plays. Currently, his options are maze, cursor training game, visual acuity, and chase, and we will add more games to choose from as he masters them. We have begun expanding the number of animals trained on EVE with seven Navy sea lions currently participating and look forward to providing EVE as enrichment outside of trainer guided sessions. We would like to thank Jen Dunham, Chris Harris, and especially Dr. Mark Zitko for their invaluable support of this project. From idea inception, troubleshooting, and scheduling sessions, these are the people that really have made it happen. But a project like this also needs the collaboration of a lot of different people doing a lot of different things. A very special thank you to our Navy teammates who have helped in the construction and implementation of EVE. To our Paraton colleagues who mount monitors and plexiglass to utility carts and build projector screen frames and brackets that can withstand our San Diego breezes, a massive thank you. And a very special thank you to the, all the SAIC and National Marine Mammal Foundation trainers who have invested time and energy in training the animals to interact with EVE, as well as the interns and students that have assisted with setup, breakdown, and running of EVE sessions. Thank you all for taking the time to come to this presentation and we are happy to take questions. All right, thank you so much. That was so cool. Um, we have a couple questions. Um, so we can get started with the first one, which is how did you decide the requirements, for example, three games or a certain success rate for sea lions um, graduating to another level? That's a really good question. So for some of the games, like the maze game, for example, we are using a really stringent um, criteria such as 90% success rate, just so we can be sure that the animal is not being too um, challenged or the levels are not too difficult and EVE becomes less fun. Um, the whole point of the system is for it to be really, really enriching and reinforcing for the animals. So when they're first learning how to operate the games, we're really relying on the trainers to monitor the animal to see how they're picking up different concepts, such as holding down a button. Um, when they switch buttons, are they really tracking what's on the screen? Um, so a lot of those early stages are more about how the animal seems to be interacting with the system as opposed to a really stringent criteria, I would say. And I think the 90% we pulled from Schusterman's work mm -hmm. for the most part. We base a lot of, especially with these games, we're basing it on a lot of work that's been done with primates. There's been a lot of really great research that has um, incorporated a system like this. And so we're kind of looking at what they've done, what's worked with their animals to make sure that we can really say these animals understand the concepts. All right, um, thank you. We have a second question and this is, have you explored cooperative or competitive multi-animal games? That's a great question. That's something that we haven't done yet, but it has been on our docket since this is like pretty much since it started day one. <laughs> since day one. Um, it's been something I think we're really interested in. There's a lot of really great um, work that's been done with cooperation in um, cetaceans like in bottlenose dolphins. And I think that this system is a really unique way to test that and um, to really test that within pinnipeds as well. So we're really looking forward to hopefully having a multi, um, multiplayer game, even multi-species. So we're, we're excited for that. Great, great. All right. Next question is, um, do all the sea lions seem to like playing it or do some enjoy Eve better than others? I think they all enjoy it very much. Some seem to enjoy it more than others, but when we're setting up the system, they're all sitting as close as they possibly can, um, hoping that it's their turn to come in and play. Um, one of the things we wanna look at is, we have some animals that have never played, but they've watched others play and they're sitting at the door, like waiting for it to be their turn. Um, and we wanna see if they have any benefit from having been able to watch before they're introduced to the system. So. Um, I would say pretty confidently that they very much enjoy playing Eve. All right. Um, so when the animal is successful, do they always receive fish or ice, or do they also receive other forms of secondary reinforcement like tactile or EVD, EEDs or some other type? 
<laughs> uh, we have a couple animals that um, really enjoy just us cheering for them. And sometimes our cheering is sufficient and they, they don't need any more fish. They're good to just keep playing. Um, we like to bring in, bring in a lot of people and have a little crowd. Um, they seem to really also feed off the energy in addition to the fish and the ice that we offer. Um, we don't really do tactile in, as a reinforcer for Eve just because of the setup. Um, we're just not positioned in a way where we could really reach out easily. Um, but yeah, they definitely, they enjoy cheering in addition to the fish and the ice. And some of them just like to play. They find the game reinforcing in and of itself. Very interesting. Um, so it kind of leads into what are some of the possible future applications of this? Oof. Oh, my we have a list. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there's, I think there's so many really great opportunities that we have to understand more about animal cognition. The fact that these animals are learning how to operate an interface. I mean, if you look at just the primate literature in the past couple of decades, all of the different games that they've been able to create for the animals, all of the things that they've been able to learn about how animals process information, their memory. I think I'm, I'm really excited to see the application of this in terms of like the animal's vision and monitoring their visual health since um, these animals are living so long. Uh, under the great care of the Navy. So being able to track that over time is really exciting. I really have enjoyed seeing the individual variation in animals and which uh, who likes what game more. Um, and at the end of the day, this is really something that's about their welfare and it's about you know them finding the system enriching and reinforcing. So I'm excited to keep providing new games to see how they react to those games and then make more games that they like in a similar way. We, we have a lot of questions um, that we want to ask and we haven't had time to, Kelly does all the programming and she has not been able to keep up with the amount of things that we want to do. Um, so we've brought in some fantastic interns that when we have a research question that we haven't had the time ourselves to do, um, they've come in and programmed and trained the animals and asked those questions themselves. So um, we're always looking for fabulous interns <laughs> for the for Eve sure. project. For sure. Um, this next one is, have you found that age makes any difference in their cognitive success with this game? I would say so far, <laughs> no. Um, I haven't noticed anything. I think what's made most, most, most of the difference as more and more animals kind of start learning the system is the the experience that we have. So mm -hmm. us understanding what helps um, the animals understand the concepts. This is completely novel. We're asking them to push a button and look at the screen at the same time. Um, so that can be kind of a lot at first, but now that we understand kind of the steps and the, um, the hurdles that the animals need to kind of get over to understand those two very different simultaneous things, it just goes faster and faster for these animals. And I don't really think it's age um, is so much as just our ability to be better teachers for them. Got it, got it. Um, do you think that this process could be used to teach things like simple math, like addition? <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. I mean, I think it's from, from a cognitive standpoint, it's unclear if that would be something that they could be capable of doing, but I could definitely say like this is system is a way that that could probably happen. Um, I think once again, it goes back to them having that interface. So if they're able to, you know, understand that uh, the cursor, you know, they're operating the cursor and the game is going to teach them a new concept. I think that there's the possibility to examine something like that for sure. One of our trainers recently designed a quantity assessment game based on some previous work that had been done in different species. And we are just, just starting to introduce it to the animals. So I don't even know what that looks like yet, but it's something that we are really interested in. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, what differences have you noticed in the learning process between species? And then there's another one that's kind of a follow on, but I'll ask, I'll ask you to answer that first. So <laughs> I would say that's a really good question. We're still kind of about a little bit over halfway through with dolphins. So I would say so far, it's kind of hard to make the comparison because their controller setup is so different. So I think the dolphins controller is a lot more intuitive. Um, because they have that bony rostrum, them pressing buttons um, didn't seem like it was going to work really well. So that's why we went for the bite plate and the joystick. 
Um, and so it seems like it might be a little bit more of an intuitive design. They seem to be moving a little bit faster, but once again, I can't necessarily attribute that to them, the cognitive differences between them as much as their setup is different. Um, so I would, I would say the most challenging thing originally with the dolphins is knowing where they were looking. And so that was just based on where their eyes are located, um, where sea lions, you can really tell when they're looking at the screen. And so for the dolphins, that's why we had to go through that additional step of the hand signals was um, to make sure that they were getting information from the screen and weren't just looking to the trainer for, for confirmation. Yeah, so I mentioned that the next one follows on and somebody asked, um, how I may be, be able to do a killer whale version because of their size and the need for equipment that could support that type of interaction. Oh, absolutely. I think this is pretty much the, the first version of the dolphin controller. Just like with the sea lion controller, we started with that really large box and we we're like, okay, this isn't working really well. There seems to be getting really confused. We do have plans for the dolphin controller to change. Um, I'm under the impression that once the animals understand what the interface is like, that they are controlling that blue circle, learning a new interface is going to be very simple. So we have some ideas of different types of controllers that we could use for the dolphins that could then subsequently be adapted potentially for the sea lions or for other species and larger cetaceans as well. Um, in the concept of see one, do one, teach one, do you think you could have the sea lions teach each other to play? I think so. We haven't explored it yet. Um, the The way that the ones that are not playing sit and watch, and they're so in tune to what's going on, um, it it seems like that's in the realm of possibility. We'd have to do a little more research before we kind of put together that plan. But um, again, it's something that we are very interested in looking at, mm -hmm. and I think they could. <laughs> All right. Um... Let's see here. I think we're waiting on a few more to come in. Is there anything else you guys want to talk about in the meantime? Any other things that have come up? Well, that was a lot of good questions. Yeah, that was a great question. <laughs> I think it is. There's just so many. We we have such a wonderful team around us and the trainers and the students and the interns are all so excited about participating. So they've always got really great ideas and it's always fun. We're like, oh, have you thought about this? We're like, yes, we've thought about this. We just have to have to get to that next stage. And I think it's so exciting to have this kind of interface because it does just open up the doors and um, to have the animals be so enthusiastic about participating has really just made it so much more exciting because it's coming up with the next game that's going to get just as much engagement as, as Chase, because Chase seems to be the favorite right now, according to the selection game. So um, that's been really, really cool. So someone said, I have fond memories of video game music from my childhood with Nintendo. Are there any plans to support audio elements for games in either species? <laughs> can you, can you? You want me to repeat that? Yes, yes please. please. Um, they said, I have fond memories of video game music from my childhood with Nintendo. <laughs> Are there any plans to support audio elements for games in either species? Mm -hmm. Definitely oh, yes. could. Yeah. yeah, we've got, we have a lot of ideas to incorporate. Um, <laughs> we have so many fantastic researchers at the foundation and at the Navy that have done uh, research into bioacoustics, research into communication. And I have talked at great length <laughs> with them about some of the great possibilities that we have to kind of incorporate those elements into a game, especially for um, you know, dolphins who are very acoustically centered uh, individuals. That would be really interesting to kind of see um, how, how they in interact with more of a, a acoustic version of a game than a visual game for sure. And some of our trainers provide their own soundtrack and write their own <laughs> video game songs. <laughs> um, someone also asked if there's any changes in blood chemistry of different changes of the task or learning process. I'm not sure that you guys have ever done that, but. On our list. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, it's definitely on the list. It's yeah. on our list. Um, yeah, we were interested in looking at stress, homor stress hormones um, just at different times, different interv intervals when these animals are playing. Um, again, something we'd really like to do. I think we've anecdotally seen that they seem um, relaxed and sort of just 
kind of content afterwards. Um, so it's something that we definitely would like to explore a little bit. Um, for the sea lion who picks the game, does he have a favorite? <laughs> right now it's Chase. Um, he loves Chase. <laughs> I think we all could have guessed that before it was an option <laughs> because you know, there's no stopping him when he gets to play chase. So <laughs> currently that's his favorite. He'll mix it up. Um, and occasionally he'll set up one where he has a little more of a challenge and then usually he'll go right back to chase. So that's his favorite right now. Have you, um, I guess there's a game. Have you tried a memory game like the old electronic game, Simon? Have you heard of Simon? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, and that's so funny. We, we've been talking about doing that game for quite a while. <laughs> that's another one that's been like kind of on the list um, as kind of like one of the original games that was kind of proposed. Like, oh, do you remember Simon? Have you ever played Simon? We could have a game like that. So that's definitely been something that we've um, talked about and, you know, coming up with like the interface and the sound and like all of that kind of uh, stuff is on the list yeah. for sure. Um. How would an intern get involved and what qualifications would they need? Oh, that's a great question. Please. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you can definitely email info at nmmf.org and they can put you in touch with us. Um, we're interested in working with undergraduate students, graduate students, um, psychology background, biology background, computer science background. Um, we really pride ourselves in trying to provide a very well-rounded experience for our internship program. Um, we can host you anywhere from three months to six months, uh, and we get you involved with the sea lions and the dolphins. Um, we also have interns work with the sound and health team, which does a lot of really amazing research um, in welfare as well. So we try to provide a really well-rounded internship. So we take very well-rounded interns or interns um, that are just trying to kind of figure out what is exactly their passion. They know they like these different things. This is a great opportunity to get your hands in all of it and figure out you know, what, what it is is your favorite. Celeste, you might be muted. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I do that once. Um, so we're gonna um, we're gonna wrap it up here pretty soon. But the the couple questions in one. Um, people are wondering if it could be used at other zoos and aquariums, and um, someone asked if they could even purchase e for you. We'd love it. <laughs> we would love yes. it to go everywhere. <laughs> Yes, send us an email and we can definitely talk about that. This is something that, you know, it was built for animal welfare. It was built for animal enrichment. And so the more animals that it can impact, the happier that, that will be for sure. Um, like Amber said, we've seen a lot of really great anecdotal changes in animal behavior, their engagement, their excitement to participate. Um, and it's it's been a really, really great tool, I think, for us in the past three years. And so we'd love to see that expand to other facilities as well. All right. Well, I am going to go ahead and wrap it up. Then I want to say thank you very much to Kelly and Amber for joining us and doing the scientific snapshot. I also want to point out that um, it's that time of year and we're in the season of giving. So we're currently fundraising to support all of our community engagement efforts. Um, including things like this, but also all of, our, all of our youth programs. So please consider donating to support future programs like this one. Um, or if you want, we currently have some sales of NMMF gear going on. I'll go ahead and put those in the chat, but one of the campaigns closes tonight. So if you would be interested in something like that, um, go ahead and take a look now. So I just put that in the chat area. Um, and again, thank you everybody for joining us. And if you have any other questions, you can feel free to join us or sorry to email us, <laughs> join us next time, but also email us at info at nmmf.org. So thanks again, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you. Thank you guys. Bye.